Hi, this is Wayne Zell and welcome to Blueprint for Wealth, your video cast that hopefully helps you realize your personal dreams of wealth and freedom. And today we have a special guest, Josh Keen, who is a, a partner as well as on the executive committee at Johnson Lambert. Welcome, Josh. Welcome to the to the podcast. Great. Good to see you, Wayne. Glad to be here. Good to see you too. A little bit about Josh first. I'll give you a little bit of his background. Um, he is a partner, a CPA, um, and an auditor and, auditor and a technical advisor um, for insurance companies, nonprofits, and employee benefit plans. But uh, he also has a, another side to him, which you know most accountants they have they have lots of sides to them, as I can attest. And outside of the office, he he likes to play guitar. He stays active by running and uh, he likes to just make music. Um, but beyond that, um, he is very involved at Johnson Lambert, both in terms of servicing clients, but also sort of overseeing the financial side of the firm. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Josh, tell me a little bit about you. Where did you uh, where did you grow up? Uh, how did you end up uh, getting to Johnson Lambert? What was your path? Yeah, so. I actually, uh, I've seen a lot of the world. I had nomadic parents. Um, my parents got married very young, right out of high school and moved to Denver, Colorado, actually uh, Grand Lake, Colorado, a little mountain town. And that's where I was born, me and my brother there. And then we moved from Grand Lake to uh, Dallas, Texas. It's been a couple of years in Dallas and then about seven years in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. And luckily wow. we moved, my dad sold a company uh, in Oklahoma that he had built up, sold that company and we moved east to the East Coast. Um, so we moved into Richmond, Virginia, and that's where I uh, spent the last half of my high school career and then went to William & Mary uh, down in Williamsburg as, uh, as college. And then Great school. Landed, yeah. We, no, we can attest to that. I owe a lot to William & Mary. I've met uh, my wife there as well as I uh, met Johnson Lambert. So Awesome. Awesome. And did you go straight out of William & Mary into Johnson Lambert? Yeah. So I, I watched your uh, podcast a couple of weeks ago about Larry Johnson. You had him as one of your guests. and. Uh, he was one that came down on recruited on campus. You know, it was the big six were coming down doing their song and dance. And I listened to Larry he said, okay, let's go be the little guy, slay dragons and have fun doing it. And uh, that really resonated with me as a, a young student that a uh, early professional. And yeah, it's been a one-stop career. I just finished my 24th busy season now with the firm. Um, wow. so. Johnson Lambert. So it's Larry Johnson and Debbie Lambert, uh, both uh, visionaries. They split off a, a while back, but uh, Debbie continued to grow the firm and it was sort of her vision to continue it. Tell us a little bit about Johnson Lambert. How many folks are there today and uh, how is the firm focused? Yeah. So I've been part of the firm, like I said, for about 24 years. When I first joined, we had two offices. We we're here in uh, the Northern Virginia area and then Burlington, Vermont. Uh, since then, we've grown. We added six more offices, kind of conquered the East Coast, the I-95 corridor, and now Chicago and Atlanta were our last two. Uh, we have about 180 uh, professional employees uh, serving clients in our primary industry niches, which are insurance companies, uh, not-for-profits, and employee benefit plans. And that uh, seems like a very basic business model that Larry and Debbie started when they uh, stepped away from their, their predecessor firm, saying, let's just go be that alternative to the big six and um, have that small firm feel as far as who we are as individuals, but also that big, feel, big firm feel when we go to deliver service to our clients that we can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the big guys. When you when you refer to the big six, I kind of laugh. When I joined a public accounting uh, 42 years ago, it was the big eight. And I was with a firm that was once uh, powerful, then became defunct and is now powerful again, Anderson. Um, I also worked for Price Waterhouse and Coopers, but I, uh, I, I, you know, I understand the, the strength of these firms. Now it's the big four. And uh, there are a lot of firms that are behind it. Where where would Johnson Lambert fall in the rankings of accounting firms nationwide? Do you have any idea about that? Yeah, so we're we're fairly small as far as a firm goes, um, revenue size. You know, we're probably in the top um, 100 firms inside, okay. in North America. Um, but inside the insurance industry, we are now number five. So the, we call them the final four. The big four is the uh, name that everybody knows when you go through college and get recruited. But uh Little Johnson Lambert now is number five in North America of auditors of insurance companies. And so that's really uh, something so, we take a lot of pride in. Yeah. I mean, you all are experts in the insurance industry and in auditing insurance companies. How how did you maintain that focus and how do you continue to maintain that dominance um, over all these other firms that are out there? 
Yeah, so in this, insurance is a unique industry. It's one of those, um, you don't know your cost of goods sold until many years down the road. So you're pricing these products and a lot of estimates go into their financial reporting process. So being a deep expert in that field uh, definitely um, is required. Uh, there's a different regulatory environment. There's a whole different basis of accounting for insurance companies, statutory accounting. And so really being able to um, stay on top of what's new and exciting in the industry, uh, we volunteer and serve in various leadership capacities. So have members on the insurance expert panel for the AICPA, uh, serve on the auditing standards boards and different uh, aspects that we really just, um, we, we look a lot bigger than we are as a firm. And that uh, I think our clients really appreciate that, that we are sitting there around the table as decisions are being made at some of these regulatory environments and uh, can bring that information to them real time and stay, stay in front of the change that's always on the horizon because that's one thing that the insurance industry is always doing is evolving and changing. And, Lots of things going on to keep in, keep in touch with. What types of changes are you seeing now in the insurance industry, particularly with respect to how they're being audited and financial accounting standards board standards and the insurance uh, industry standards that are being imposed on the insurance companies? What, what, what changes are coming about? Yeah, so I think everybody, all industries are seeing this, um, just the, the, the data analytics, the wave of the future is going to be in big data and using that information to identify risk, you know, be able to do continuous audits to, to a certain degree rather than just um, one time a year coming in, beating up one balance sheet. Um, the insurance industry has done a, a pretty good job of adapting to change. Um, obviously, there's peaks and valleys along the way, um, wildfires, hurricanes, all the things that we all have to deal with as far as what's out there, we have to ensure the risks on and then uh, responding to you know the pricing that goes along with it. And then our jobs as the auditors is to make sure, and the regulators as well, is make sure those companies are there to make good on the promises that they've sold. Um, so that's really the role we play is, is making sure that there's assurance over the numbers that they're presenting and the, the solvency of those organizations. It's interesting that you touch on big data. How do you all as an accounting firm utilize and access data to do the auditing function? I, I imagine that uh, you're testing some of the assumptions that they're using when they're making predictions about claims and losses going forward. Yeah, so it's definitely an evolving science and um, a lot of investment being made uh, internally on our side of things, but also within the industry. Um, you know, we really focus in on our core uh, industry being the property casualty market. And so we've developed recipes for being able to take a premium register or a loss register and run it through and come out with canned um, analytics and different uh, you know, data analysis that really is useful for us as the auditors, but then uh, sometimes as a, in a consulting capacity when we're not serving as the auditors, using that to help our um, you know, consulting um, clients to clean information that they may not have access to themselves. Are you having to hire specialists in data analytics and artificial intelligence today? We are. Uh, we've actually got a really great uh, chief innovation officer uh, who really, uh, he's grown up inside the firm, has really kind of been our back back office guy, but he's really leading our internal in initiatives as far as uh, where to make our investments in the technology and then um, using internal resources as much as possible to then, you know, really customize those tools to, to you know, meet the needs that we're able to then turn around and sell to the marketplace. Um, or again, just keep up with the pace of the you know, pace of change around us as the auditing industry, you know, more and more shifting towards that electronic environment rather than what used to be very much a paper-based oh, uh, sure. process. Has Johnson Lambert gotten involved in any of the captive insurance companies around the country, micro captives, as well as the bigger, bigger captives? Yes, yeah, so we try to stay away from the micro captives to a degree, just so they've got some uh, bad press, some IRS scrutiny. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, we w that was the the, the founding um, change that you know Larry and Debbie jumped on right away when Vermont passed their legislation to allow captives. Uh, they were the first domicile in the, in the United States, um, and so we were on boots on the ground first off, you know, as, as that legislation came out, and we now I think audit more captives than any other firms um, up there, and so. Big names like Coca-Cola and other things, but also, like I said, some smaller, you know, family type uh, risk retention group or not risk retention groups. But um, we do audit those retention groups, but, you know, smaller captives that are single parents that are just, you know, writing one or two policies a year type thing. How did you all get involved in the nonprofit side of things and how big of a practice is that as part of Johnson Lambert? Yeah, so it's it's been a part of us since uh, 96, so about two years before I joined the firm. Uh, Two individuals uh, left away from another firm, joined Johnson Lambert. They knew that Larry and Debbie um, from their prior um, 
experiences and said, you know, let's do this together. And so uh, that was here in the Northern Virginia area, which obviously has a lot of concentration of nonprofits given the proximity to DC. And um, so, yeah, that's been a part of our niche focus uh, in the Virginia office. That's probably 45% of our revenue is coming out of the, the nonprofit space. Um, so wow. a good, good, good chunk of our revenue. Do you all get involved on the tax side of things or is it just purely auditing and assurance? Yeah, so we do definitely have a, a tax expertise. You know, nonprofits, you know, while they're tax exempt, still have compliance requirements, and so we've got a, a nonprofit tax team. And then the insurance space, there's a lot going on with our our tax projects there um, on the consulting side, as well as those that we're actually serving as the auditors for. And then there's also a portion of the practice that deals with employee benefits as well. So are you all auditing qualified plans and 401k plans? Is that typically your your uh, your focus? Yeah, you're, you're very timely. This is the kickoff of our benefit plan season. Most of those uh, have calendar year ends, but the work usually happens in the summertime. Keep everybody um, busy. So that, yeah, it's, it's it's a good good mix for us. We have a lot of interns coming through, so it's a great experience for them to actually get real client experience um, working on an audit. Uh, but yeah, that is primarily what we do from June to October 15th deadline is, is working on those employee benefit plans. And um, in terms of the percentage of the practice, if you had to estimate, what percentage is the insurance? What percentage is nonprofit? What percentage is uh, employee benefits? Yeah. So like I said, um, about 85% of our revenue firm-wide is on the insurance space. Wow. That includes uh, work that we do. Um, regulators uh, tend to outsource some of their exams. So we have actually a regulatory team that uh, serves as the uh, arms and legs for regulators as they do their financial condition exam auditing the insurance companies themselves, their financial statements, as well as um, the tax services. So about 85% there. And then um, probably 10% of our, our revenue is coming from the nonprofit practice. But here in Virginia, as well as our Chicago land office, that's the other you know, big component of our- Are the nonprofits um, mostly trade associations or are they also charities, 501c3, c4s, and that, that type of entity? Yeah, it's a good mix. A lot of trade associations uh, here in Virginia, um, again, given the proximity, lo the lobbying for the, yes. the trade groups. Um, but yeah, the charitable organizations are, are fun and exciting. I love working on those as well, you know, out there doing good in the world and have a, a nice mix of things that, you know, they're actually doing, um, you know, kind of capital formation to to, um, to make projects happen around the world that are, are you know, doing good at either green, you know, green initiatives or, you know, small business, uh, minority owned women owned um, activities. So it's, it's a neat mix to, to work on, you know, all three of those industries, but, uh, sure. but I do, I do really love a nonprofit that's out there just making a change in the world. And that's a big part of my practice them. too. I really enjoy that. And it's something that uh, you're always giving back when you're helping them. Yeah. Even if they're paying you um, one, yeah. one, uh, one last question for you today. And that is, really dealing with business succession. I'm writing a book on business succession planning. It should be out this year. Um, I'm interviewing a lot of different people about their business exit plans or business succession plans, because it's not always an exit. And the, the interesting thing about Johnson Lambert is, I don't think there's really an exit anticipated. I think it's really continue to grow and thrive and allow partners to retire and bring on new partners. Tell us a little bit about how your business succession plan works uh, without revealing too many confidences, but also the idea of uh, you know non-exit for a small niche firm. Yeah, no, I, I think I said this before, um, I wouldn't want to play chess against Debbie Lambert because I think she was always 10 moves ahead. Um, but uh, you you were instrumental in helping the firm, you know, kind of morph from what it was when Larry and Debbie were the, the core partners. Um, our partnership agreement has been written in a way that it's uh, clear up front about how, how folks will retire. Uh, Debbie was our third retired partner now. Um, and we've got a payout plan that works basically, you know, 10 years after retirement, there's a value that's been calculated. It's known up front, um, and it's really incentivizing folks to grow the firm. That the calculation is based on firm-wide revenue rather than being your book of business, and so that really does, I think, help transition in a safe and healthy way that people aren't hoarding the book of business to maximize their retirement value. They're out there. Let's go grow and sell, pass on what you've learned, and um, pass on those clients to the next generation to keep them in the firm as long as possible. And um, so, yeah, I think that's really, you know. Um, it seems like a simple strategy when you when you step back from it, but it is also one where you just don't have to have that argument of, hey, I'm worth this and this is what my value is and you're going to buy me out. Um, 
it's really been designed in a way that everyone joining the partnership knows upfront what it means and what their expectations can be heading, heading into retirement. So it's done as a team. It's done as a complete firm. No one individual controls the value or the value of the firm. And that is what is so beautiful about the business succession model that you all have constructed. And uh, I, it was a pleasure to be a part of that because uh, the creativity that went into that was, uh, was incredible. And uh, I applaud you all for that too. It's really, it's not an easy thing to achieve in professional services, particularly. Everybody says, hey, that's my client, right? Yeah, you no, know, and I, I think you know you were instrumental in helping helping us navigate through that you know evolution of the uh, of the firm. So really appreciate your wisdom and, and advice along the way. One last uh, last question for you today, and that is, if if the economy were to turn down and were to adversely affect property and casualty insurance companies, which is a large part of your business, or if there was a major disaster which affected uh, you know companies, I remember there was a company back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s that uh, a, f a friend of mine actually had started. It was a big property casualty insurance company out of New Jersey, did not survive. Um, how will that impact your practice and impact the business succession plan at Johnson Lambert? So I think that's one thing that I um, really appreciate the insurance industry. It's, it's very well regulated. And so those insolvencies are few and far between, luckily. Um, but it's also a great uh, hedge against downturns in the economy as being an auditor of insurance companies because it's they have to have it by, by statute every year. They have to have an audit of their financial statements. And so regardless of whether um, things are going well in the industry or not, they still have to hire auditors to do that work. Beautiful. So that's that's really where we, uh, we kind of have a hedge against the downturn in the economy. Do you feel that you have an edge also because of your size? You're able to offer services at a more... Uh economical price than what uh, the big four would offer? Yeah, we, we just don't have the overhead that the big four national office, you know, brings to the table. And, you know, some of it's got an advantage and some of it's a disadvantage, right? There's there's a lot of investments that are necessary in the technology side of things that, that are expensive. Um, but yeah, so I think really when we uh, go toe to toe from a service perspective, um, we, the value we bring is that expertise at a price that makes sense. That is not the New York City big four um, billing rates. It's the Johnson Lambert billing rates. And it's also done in a way that it's, um, you know, our biggest clients sometimes are the smaller clients of the, of the big four. And so we can really deliver that service um, proposition and value and relationship that they're looking for as a bus business partner um, in a way that they're they're near and dear to our hearts as much as we are to them. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. We've been talking with Josh Keen, a partner at Johnson Lambert. And if you want to know more about them, visit them on the web at Johnson, johnsonlambert.com, correct? That's correct. Um, for all of you that are operating insurance companies or contemplating it or nonprofits, if, uh, if you need some help on the audit side, please, uh, please check them out. I'm Wayne Zell, and you've been listening to Blueprint for Wealth. Thanks for tuning in and stay tuned for a special topic right after this.